We've been teaching in the last few weeks and months about what takes place after Pentecost. Now, you sure you all hear me real well? Yeah. What takes place after Pentecost? It's a very important issue in your Bible because the majority of the church thinks that the church starts on the day of Pentecost, and from there on, everything in the Bible is to you. Well, we've seen clearly that that's not the case. After Pentecost, the kingdom gospel is still preached all the way up to Acts chapter 8, and then an event takes place. Somebody gets saved, and that gets changed. That man is Saul of Tarsus, and he gets a revelation of the mystery. My message this morning and my thought is going to be this. What the mystery reveals that is not in prophecy. Does a re mystery reveal anything that is not in prophecy? <laughs> it's not in prophecy. It's not in prophecy. <laughs> Everything the mystery reveals to you is not prophecy. Now, if you're familiar with our chart, and I, I hope you'll, you'll get you a, a small one back there. The chart shows you where we're living today in the dispensation of the grace of God, the, the mystery time here. This is Paul. And things change in here when Paul gets saved because God reveals a message to him. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning that I've thought about many times. Virginia and I were talking about this past week. And that is... What did someone say in time past, or what verse of scripture did someone share with you that made a real big impact on your life that got you to understanding the issue of the mystery? Do any of you remember a passage of scripture that somebody shared with you that made a difference in your life, made a turning point in your life? Well, you think about that while we're talking. I'm going to share with you one this morning that made a difference in my life. Now, the mystery we're talking about, turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Romans chapter 16 in verse 25. And we'll find that term because amazingly, there is so many people that when you read this to them, they say, I never heard that before. Now, you know what? There's no excuse for that because they have the Bible. They're taught to study the Bible. We should read it. And so we should know these verses. Now, I know there's some, every now and then you read some you haven't read in a long time you forgot about, and that's understandable. But in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Now, that covers a lot. But the question is, does it really mean what it says? And what is it saying? What is it saying? It says, Paul is telling us something other here. And what it is, it's, it's, it's his gospel. Now to him that has the power to establish you, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He can establish you, but how is he going to do it? He's going to do it by the revelation that he gave to Paul. Now you say, well, I thought all the Bible's for us. Yes, it is. All the Bible's for you. And he goes on and says that in verse 26. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. But Paul's message is unique and different. And that verse of scripture says that Jesus Christ can establish you. Now you know the difference between establish and establish. In the book of Romans, you start out with people being established. When you get to Romans chapter 16, now you should be established. There's a difference. One is a process, the other one is getting grounded, getting there. So by the time you get here, you should be grounded. And the way you're going to be grounded is by this thing called my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Three things. Paul says 
my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, I read that years ago when I was in another church, and I got saved at a very young age, and there's never been any doubt about that. There's been a lot of doubt about what I understood about the Bible over the years. But years ago, when my wife and I were, actually when we started going together and, and, and when we got married, we attended a little church in Dade City. And there was a fellow come along that I met, and he was a family member. And uh, he was a missionary-type preacher called an interstate missionary. And he went around establishing churches and teaching to these little groups but his health was getting bad and his family was not able to help him very much, so he asked me on occasion to drive him down to where his church was at. They met just whenever he would come. You know, they didn't meet regular. So I did, and I started going to this little church. It was down in Bunker Hill, by the way. You ever heard of Bunker Hill? <laughs> South of here. Mm -hmm. And so we went down there to that little group of people, and uh, I started listening to him, and I come back to church, and. Listen to him. Then I was in the insurance business years later, and I went by his house where he lived that up in Webster to visit with him. And as usual, he would always talk about the Bible, about verses and stuff. And he had a real knack for asking me, what do you think about this verse? And I'd tell him. And he says, well, you, you think about that now, and... When you come back next week, because I, I worked in that area every week, and so I would come by, and I'd spend a little time with him. And he says, when you come back, you tell me, what do you think about this verse? And so I would get home, and by the time I read the verse he told me to think about, to go along with the verse that he had already asked me about, I realized right then I was a mess. <laughs> because what I thought about that verse, that other verse just completely blew it out of the water. And you know, that's the starting of, of understanding your Bible. When you think you know something or another, but someone points out to you, you know, that's not what that's saying. You can read stuff in light of what somebody else tells you, and you read it that way. You believe it. I quoted scripture for years completely wrong because someone said that's what the verse says. You get brainwashed to read it. So we need to, to read and to think about those things. But eventually I started taking him down a little more and I got really into what he was teaching. And I realized then, he, he always said that he taught something a little different to Baptist, he'd learned something, and that he had learned from a man named Ben Bogart. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not, he'd been dead for years, but. He said he, he learned something from him in his traveling around and establishing these churches. And the thing that he learned was that the message of Paul was different than the rest of the Bible. And I thought, well, how, how can that be? How, how can that be different from the rest of the Bible? You know, we've been taught that that's just a continuation of the Israel and the church and so forth, you know. And so... It finally got to that point where I realized that I was all messed up. And so he read me a passage of scripture a few years later. And that passage of scripture really stuck with me. Because it's like Romans chapter 16 here is a, is a verse that you read, but you don't read it. And so last week as we closed out our message here, I shared that verse with you. But that's the verse that changed my way of thinking about things. And by the way, that man's dead today. Been dead for many years. His name was Willard. <laughs> Willard. Willard Connell. He was my wife's uncle. He's the one that got me looking at the Bible right. And so... He gave me this passage of scripture, and he, he told it several times, but Virginia and I got this, and we were talking this past week, and says, you know, that's a passage of scripture. Virginia brought it up. That's a passage of scripture that really meant a lot to us and got us going right. 
And what it is, is Galatians chapter 1. And I want you to highlight it there so you can read it and think about it, like you do with Romans 16, 25. As we said many times, people read verses, but they don't know what they say. They, they listen to what somebody else says, and they just believe that's what it says, and that's what it means. Well, that's not always the truth. But in Galatians chapter 1, we read this last week, but I'm going to read it again because it's so good. Paul says here as he's writing to one of the churches that he had started after he began his ministry. And he says, but I certify you, brethren. Do you know what it means to certify something? That's putting a stamp or something on it that guarantees it's what it says it is. The uh, highway patrolmen in their police cars that they travel up and down the road with, they have a certified speedometer. And it has a, a stamp right across the plane. It says certified, certified or calibrated speedometer. So they can check you without having to get a gun and all that kind of stuff and set up. You know, they can, and when they say you're running 100, you're running 100. But anyway, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man. Number one now. I did not receive it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the power of it. We thank you for what it means. We thank you for its life-giving power if we trust it. We thank you that your word has been preserved so that we know about the shed blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how he shed it for us and paid for all of our sins, that we might have eternal life as a free gift. I pray this morning, Lord, if there's one here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that right now they will understand that Jesus Christ died for their sins and they can trust you and believe in that and nothing else because nothing else will save. As Bob said this morning, Lord, nothing can add to the grace of God. Grace is sufficient and you saved us because of the shed blood of your son. The perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God given for us. Thank you this morning, Lord, for everyone here. We pray now as your word goes out that it will bless each and every heart. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I hope you understand enough of that passage of scripture to know that it's right up here. Where is what Paul teaches? Where is what he calls my gospel on this chart? Well, you find it right in here to right over here. That's the only section in that chart right there that covers the information that you get in the Pauline epistles. Is it enough? It's the revelation of the mystery. It tells you all the stuff that back there that the nation of Israel was dealing with under the law, and that's done away with. The law is over. It tells you about the time out here in, the, in our future when the Tribulation period is going to come, but then it gives you some wonderful good news. We're going to be raptured out of here. We're not going to be here for the rapture, for the tribulation period. We're not going to be here for the wrath. God's wrath is not going to be poured out on us in any way. Why isn't it? Why is God's wrath not going to be poured out on us in any way? People say today, God's mad with me. He's whipping me. He's doing this and that and the other. No, God's not doing that. Why is God not pouring out his wrath on you? Saved from the wrath to come. What? We are saved from the wrath to 
We are saved from the wrath to come, so why don't we get any of the raft? We're saved from it just like how we saved with eternal life. We're saved from that wrath to come. And the reason we're saved from that wrath to come is simply this. God did pour out his wrath on you. When did he do it? Cross. At that cross right there. That cross. On that cross, God poured out all of his wrath on sin. The sin of all mankind. And when he poured out his wrath on that and he shed his blood, you know what he did? He washed away all the sins. Took care of all the problems. You're saved today with eternal life. You're saved from the wrath to come. But you only know that if you understand the mystery that was revealed to Paul. Now, people read that over and over, but they just don't get the idea. You know, God revealed something to him. God made known to him something. And Paul illustrates that really well and makes it clear. He said in verse 16, to reveal his son in me. To reveal his son in me. Verse 13 and 14, for you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. What was Saul of Tarsus doing when God revealed Christ to him? What was he doing? He was a Pharisee, a religious man, rabbinical scholar. He thought he knew who God was. He was going around trying to wipe out the church. And he made a lot of money from it because he was looked up to by all of his, all of his brothers in the Pharisees in the religious system. God revealed something to him. Why would he reveal something to this Jew? Why would he strike him down and reveal something to him? If he got up from there and got the revelation and went to teaching the same thing that Peter and the 12 apostles taught, the same things that Jesus Christ taught, if he got up and went to doing the same thing, why did God have to reveal Christ to him? That's an important issue, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Well, the first clue is, could the Jew at this time could they go to the Gentiles during the earthly ministry of Christ from the 12 apostles? Could they go to the Gentiles? No. Even Christ says, Matthew 15, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he changes the program because the nation of Israel rejected him. And so Saul of Tarsus is the man. God saved him. And he instituted something wonderful. What did he start in addition to just revealing to message to the Apostle Paul? Well, you know what he did? He revealed a whole new system of what he's doing and how he's going to provide all these things, not just for Israel, but for all the world. Paul's conversion was one that took him out of all that other stuff was. When he talks about then they're called from his, separated from his mother's womb, that's talking about that, that Israel, that Jewish religion and stuff. That's what he was part of. God separated him from that and called him and gave him this revelation of this mystery. So he took him out of the kingdom program. And what did he do now? Well, after the conversion of Saul... We see coming on the scene a whole new group of believers with a different outlook and different teaching and different understanding. They have a name. In Ephesians chapter 4, keep your place here, but turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. God gives some gifts to this group of people to help them go and to get established into understanding 
what this message is. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the what? Body of Christ. Is that what God is doing now? Has he set the kingdom of program aside and now he's forming the church, the body of Christ? No. Yes. And he gives gifts to these men to get that thing started because they don't have all the revelation. Paul has it. But God gives it to him and gives it to him to write down and to establish this thing. But the most important thing I want you to see about it is this is not a physical thing. The kingdom of heaven given to the nation of Israel was dealing with a group of people and a land and a kingdom and all of that. And that's where everybody wants to get in today. But what is this body of Christ? Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of over all things to the church, which is his body. So what is the body of Christ? It's the church, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He's not dealing with this kingdom of heaven on this earth. You know, years ago, somehow or another, preachers got this thing all out of whack, and it's just, it's just bloomed. They think that the kingdom of heaven is talking about heaven. But the kingdom of heaven that God promised to the nation of Israel is not the kingdom in heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom from heaven coming down to this earth, setting up a kingdom here on this earth with a group of people, a nation of people, with a land and a king. And he was going to send them a king. But, the, but the religion and everything has gone so far as to say, well, this kingdom of heaven is heaven. And so when you mix up the kingdom program and the, and the message of Paul, you know what you, you get everybody wanting to do? You get everybody today wanting to go into the kingdom. They think that heaven is going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, and that's heaven. Folks, that's not heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth and he sets up that kingdom and he rules and reigns for a thousand years, then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and it's going to be altogether different. But the thing I want you to see for right now is that this church is the body of Christ. Well, what is the body of Christ? What is the body of Christ? It is a, it's a body of of living organisms. It's not individuals, but living organisms. It's all something other that can live and function together. But all in who? Why is the church called the body of Christ? Because we are spiritually members of his body. Many, many verses teach that. This body is made up of the Jews, it's made up of the Gentiles, it's made up of all people from the time that Paul gets this message, he gets saved until the rapture. This thing is something that God is forming today to show his grace and his mercy. It's interesting when you think about it, you go back there and you look at the nation of Israel and what, what were they dealing, how were they dealing with God? What were they living under all? What were they living under? Law. Law. The covenant of the law. And the covenant of the law says, if you will do this, I'll do that. Boy, that's totally different. Totally different than what we're living in today. We're living in a spiritual organism, a spiritual member of the body, literally the body of Christ. Now, some people seem to think that the church on the corner is a body of Christ, the church. The Catholic Church thinks that the whole Catholic Church is a body of Christ. They give you the little wafers and stuff and you say, body of Christ. 
by partaking of that, they put you into the body of Christ. Well, how do you get into the body of Christ? How do you get into the body of Christ? In 1 Corinthians chapter... Come back there for just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, I believe it is. Get in 1 Corinthians, will we? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul tells you how that you get into that body. And this is one of the passages of Scripture that confuses so much of Christianity today. And it's because they just translate one word in it wrong. Well, I'm still in the wrong place. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want you to look at verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So are you one with Christ? You're one in the church, the body of Christ. Are you one then with Christ? Yes. He's the head of the body. Verse 13, now how do you get in there? For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. We're all members of that one body, but it's still one body. Now, how in the world can this church on the corner or this church over here or this denomination, how can they be the one body? How many bodies are they? One body. One body. One body. Ephesians chapter 1 tells you clearly, in, in chapter 4 I believe it is, tells you very clearly there's one body and one baptism and so forth. But in this passage of scripture, he tells you how to get in there. And he says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. This brings people to think, well, if you're going to be a member of a local church, the one body, how are you going to get in it? How are you going to get in it? By water baptism. Water baptism. So that brought on a great, great thing about baptism being necessary for our salvation. Some go that far. Some say, well, it's not necessary for our salvation, but it's necessary to get into the church. Now, I remember years ago in the church that I was in, we had a lady that got saved, and she wanted to be baptized because the preacher said, you've got to be baptized. If you can't be baptized, you can't be part of our church. But this lady had her legs wrapped up from up around her thighs all the way to her ankles, bandaged up. And she had some kind of a, a skin problem or something, and she couldn't get wet. She couldn't get in that water. Well, you know, wouldn't you make some kind of provision if you thought she was really saved and you wanted her in the church? Wouldn't you make some kind of provision for that? Mm -hmm. No. She could not be a member of the church because of that. Because they thought you had to be submerged, you had to be water baptized to become a member of that church. And when you moved from one church to the other, you had to get a letter from that church stating you were scripturally baptized. Yeah. Is water in verse 12 and 13? No. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, if we take that logically, just thinking as a human being now, turn on your thinking cap. If we're all baptized into one body, that can't be flesh, can it? Can we all live in one body? No. So it's got to be talking about spirit. The church, the body of Christ that we're members of is a spiritual organism. It's not an organization. It's not something you become a member of. It. It's something that the moment you get saved and you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
He takes you, the Spirit does, and places you into the body of Christ. And you know there's not any place in the world you could be in a better position than to be a member of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And when you get in there, you can't get out. You can't get out. Thank God. Verse 27, ye are the body of Christ and members in particularly. Where did this body start from? Where did we learn about this body of Christ? Do we find it in Isaiah? No. Jeremiah. <clears throat> How about Revelation? Now, the only place you find it is, I keep wanting to turn around and show you, but I need to. Right in here in this yellow place. That's where we're living today. That's the only place that you can get into the church, the body of Christ. It's the only place you find it. There's people that said, oh, the body of Christ, the church is named back in the Bible or here and there. And, there. You know, and they just say that, but they never show you the verse. They'll show you some verses, but it's not talking about the church, the body of Christ. Is there more than one church in the Bible? Sure there is. More than one church. How many churches is it, though, for us today in the dispensation of grace? One. That's right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, you see that right there shows you that the Bible's wrong, doesn't it? Doesn't it? We just said there's more than one baptism. We said there's more than one church. But that says one. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to the church, the body of Christ. He's talking to the church over at Ephesus. He might as well be speaking right to you this morning. Because you're a member of the body of Christ if you have trusted him as your Lord and Savior. But this message, this revelation given to Paul is only found in Paul's epistles. So when someone says, well, what, what kind of a revelation did Paul get? What, if, what was the revelation Paul got? Well, let me tell you a real simple way to answer that. Start reading in your Bible in Romans chapter 1, and you read all the way to the end of Philemon chapter 1. That's the revelation that he got. So if you want to know what the revelation is, that's where it's at. It's a message today that will perfect you. It will edify you, build you up, Make you rejoice for the first time in your life. You know, if you've been a member of some other church, you've probably been put under a performance system. I know I was in another church. Boy, I was, I was told many times, you know, if you're doing so-and-so, you need to go home and not get outside of your bed and ask God to forgive you. It was always this issue of confessing your sins and forgiving. How many times has God asked you today to forget your, confess your sins? Not one. How many times did God say today you have to ask the forgiveness of your sins to get saved? Not one. Not one. Jesus Christ took care of everything. But that's only the revelation that he gave to the Apostle Paul. What Christ accomplished on that cross, Paul calls the preaching of the cross, the revelation of the mystery. Come back there to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Chapter 1. Verse 16. Paul says, to reveal his son in me. Who is a me? Paul. Yeah, Paul is. To reveal his son in me. 
that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't have to go back there and talk to the 12 apostles. I didn't have to go back and read the prophets because when God saved Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he saved a sinner that couldn't be saved by the law. He was a blasphemer. He committed the unpardonable sin, but God reached down and saved him by his grace. Gave him to be the pattern for you and I today to get saved. If you want to know how to get saved, then you have to read this revelation. I hope and pray you will and you understand it. But again, I said, if you're not saved today and you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, don't leave here without talking to some of us or getting some more material to read so that you do understand it. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you've uh, continued to, to be with us and give us the health and the strength that we need, and especially to be able to teach just a little of your word, because your word is where it's all at. Your word is a power in the spirit. And so we trust, Lord, as we send it forth, that it will do its job, and we know that it will. We may be weak and we may fail, but your word will never fail. Your word is more powerful than anything on this planet today. Man comes up with all these bombs and missiles and stuff to try to annihilate himself, but none of it is going to work. None of it is nearly anywhere near the power of our almighty God. We thank you this morning, Lord, that you're so great that you could send your son, send your son in your place to die for us. And in reality, you gave yourself. We thank you for that. We don't understand it, but we thank you, Lord, that you did that for us. Pray, Lord, this morning that your word will go out from each and every one here, that we will share the word, the written word, and the spoken word everywhere we can. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, for we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake we pray. Amen.